Good morning, class. Today, the class covers chapter 10 of the textbook. The topic is pricing with market power. A firm can increase its profit using price discrimination if it has market power, if customers differ in their willingness to pay, if the firm can identify which customers are more price sensitive than others, and if it can prevent customers who pay low prices from reselling to those who pay high prices. This chapter builds on the previous one by considering price discrimination and other related pricing strategies for monopolies and other firms with market power. I'm going to talk about third degree price discrimination, which is another very common form of price discrimination. In earlier lessons, we've already talked about first and second degree price discrimination, so you may want to make sure you've watched those videos before you complete today's lesson. We're going to start with the definition of third degree price discrimination. This is when a firm sells the same product to different consumers for different prices based on the elasticity of demand among the consumer groups. So we learned in an earlier lesson that in order for price discrimination to occur in any market, a firm must be able to segregate the market based on consumer groups or willingnesses to pay. Now, in this case, segregation of the market is based on different consumers, willingness to pay and PEDs. In other words, responsiveness to price changes. Now, some simple examples here. This is things like age discounts at movie theaters or ski resorts and so on. We've might also include airline tickets based on the time of purchase. Some people who buy tickets very early are more likely to be vacation travelers compared to people who buy plane tickets at the last minute tend to be business travelers. Therefore, if you buy your tickets early on, you might end up paying a lower price since you're going to be more responsive to price changes. There's lots of examples of third degree price discrimination. For our graph today, I'm going to be looking at the prices for ski lift tickets. So let's give our graph a title here. We've got ski lift tickets at a local ski resort. Now we're going to assume that there are two types of consumers, two types of skiers who come to this resort. There are adults who have a relatively inelastic demand for ski lift tickets. First, of, first let's go ahead and put our labels on here. We've got price and cost, we've got quantity of lift tickets. Then we're going to draw our demand among adults for ski lift tickets. Demand among adults is relatively inelastic. It's going to be, therefore, a relatively steep demand curve. Adults tend to have more disposable income than teenagers. Therefore, they're willing to pay more for lift tickets and are less responsive to price changes. We've got our marginal revenue curve that goes with the adult's demand. Of course, it slopes twice as steep as demand does. So this is our marginal revenue among adults. What does demand among teenagers look like? Teenagers have less disposable income and they have more alternative things they could do as opposed to skiing. They might choose to hang out with friends at other places, go to the mall, go shopping, and therefore their demand is more responsive to price changes. We've got our demand for teenagers here. I'll call this DT and our marginal revenue among teenagers, which is twice the slope of demand. I'll call that MRT. So what I've done is I've put two demand curves for the two different consumer groups that the ski resort is trying to charge different prices for. The question now is how does the ski resort determine what price to charge each of these two groups? So I need to add a marginal cost curve to my graph. Marginal cost, of course, is like it is in other industries. It's going to be downward sloping, then upward sloping. Our marginal cost is going to be a upward sloping line like that. And what I can do is I can go ahead and add a price for one of the consumer groups. Let's go and add the price that the ski resort would charge for teenagers if it only considered the demand and marginal revenue among teenagers. The ski resort would sell lift tickets and price them based on teenagers demand. So I'll call this quantity T for quantity teenagers. And it would charge a price of PT. I'll call that the price that teenagers pay. But could the ski resort do better than charging the single price for teenagers? It could because there's a whole group of consumers out there who are willing to pay a higher price. Adults. 
the ski resort could be charging two prices. One price for teenagers who are more price sensitive and who have generally less demand for lift tickets than adults due to their lower disposable incomes, and a higher price for adults. But how does it know what price to charge adults? Well, here's how we can determine that price. We know that at quantity T, the firm's marginal cost is found by going up to the marginal cost curve right, right here. If I draw a dotted line over, I know that the marginal cost is here. We'll call that MC. But if I go over to the marginal revenue curve for the that goes with the adults demand, I can actually go ahead and put a price above that by going up to the demand curve. And I know that I could charge adults a higher price. I'm going to put an adult price up here. And the quantity demanded sold to adults will be down here at QA. And what have I done? I now have two prices for ski lift tickets. Instead of charging a single price of PT, I'm going to charge adults a higher price. Because at PT, the amount of tickets I would have sold to adults, do this in gray here, would have been higher. But since demand is so inelastic, the revenues the resort would have earned from adults would have been lower. So the idea here is that the resort will earn more revenues and therefore more profits by selling fewer lift tickets, but at a much higher price to adults than they sell to teenagers who have a lower willingness to pay and are more responsive to the lower prices for lift tickets. So what are the effects of this type of price discrimination? Let's go ahead and show the total profits that the ski resort would have earned if it had only charged a single price of PT, and we'll compare that to the total profits the firm will earn by charging two prices, PA and PT. First, of course, I need to add an average total cost curve, which would allow me to determine the level of economic profit. So here's my ATC, and with that, I can identify the firm's ATC at a quantity of QT, which is right here, and I can shade the area of economic profit if the ski resort had only charged a single price for all of its lift tickets. Now it would have actually sold more than QT because adults would have been willing to buy a little bit more, a few more lift tickets. So profits would have been equal to the yellow rectangle that I just shaded here. But what about through price discrimination? Now through price discrimination, the resort's actually gonna sell fewer lift tickets since it's gonna charge a higher price to those adults. So there'll be a smaller number of lift tickets sold slightly However, the profits earned are going to be significantly higher because these, this entire class of consumers, adults, people above the age of 18 presumably, are going to be paying more for their lift tickets than people under the age of 18 or 20 as it may be. So what has happened? The increase, this is our increase in profits, comes at the expense of adults who pay a higher price. However, adults are willing and able to pay a higher price for these lift tickets. Therefore, they're not necessarily worse off. However, if they had paid a lower price of PT, consumer surplus would have been considerably larger. So who's better off due to price discrimination in the third degree? Well, obviously, the resort may have chosen to charge a single price of PA, not a single price of PT. Therefore, far more teenagers are willing and able to buy lift tickets at PT than they would have been at PA. In fact, you could see that at PA, it's actually above the teenager's demand curve, so no teenagers would have been willing to buy lift tickets at a price of PA. So in this case, price discrimination has helped teenagers or those who would have been willing to buy fewer lift tickets or no lift tickets at all at the single high price. Or you could say it actually harms adults who would have been willing to buy more lift tickets at a lower price and who end up having less consumer surplus due to price discrimination. So our total consumer surplus now is gonna be the consumer surplus of the adults which is below the adult's demand curve and above the adult price of PA, plus the consumer surplus of teenagers, which is going to be the area below the teenager's demand curve and above the price of PT. So this is kind of an interesting way to show consumer surplus, but since we have two different demand curves and two different prices, we have two different areas of consumer surplus. So these two areas, represent consumer surplus under price discrimination. The increase in consumer surplus clearly is the lower of these two triangles. That's the area I'm outlining in green here because perhaps teenagers would have had to pay a higher price if it weren't for price discrimination. Therefore, more teenagers are actually able to afford to ski due to this type of price discrimination. 
Now the graph got pretty sloppy here, but it would help you to rewind the video here before I labeled all the areas of consumer surplus and profit to see how I illustrated the profit maximizing prices and quantities of the good that sellers would charge and that they would sell. So what are the consequences here? Some consumers pay a higher price. That's those with the most inelastic demand, while others pay a lower price, those with the most elastic demand. Overall, you could say more of the good is sold since price for the most sensitive consumers is lower, but definitely economic profits increase. So price discrimination of any type, first, second, or third degree, is always going to benefit the firm. It allows the firm to charge consumers who are willing to pay more a higher price. Additionally, those who are willing to pay lower prices are able to through price discrimination. In second degree, it was people who are willing to buy in bulk, usually those price-sensitive families who have less disposable income to, due to the fact that they have more kids in the house. And in third degree, it's those who simply have less disposable income or for whatever reason have a lower willingness to pay for the good they benefit due to price discrimination since they can pay a lower price and are able to afford the good. So what are some examples of third degree price discrimination? This is all around us, guys. Whenever you go to a movie theater, you see price discrimination going on. If you go to a ski resort, here's some lift ticket prices. You can see that adults above the age of 18 pay $27 more per day than juniors. Clearly, this is a way for the ski resort to extract more consumer surplus from those consumers who have a higher income and higher willingness to pay. Museum admission is the same way. Seniors, students, uh, members often get in free because they pay a membership. They're the most price sensitive consumers if they go out of their way to buy a membership. You see price discrimination of the third degree all around us. Businesses try to price discriminate based on consumers' willingness to pay all the time. Is it bad for society? Not necessarily. Is it bad for some consumers? Most certainly. Those who get discriminated against end up paying a higher price and have less consumer surplus. However, there are also those consumers who get discriminated in favor of, those who, who get to pay a lower price because of who they are, because of their gender, their age, etc. So there are advantages and disadvantages to price discrimination. One advantage that's undisputable is the fact that total profits for the firms go up. And in some cases, the quantity produced in the market will actually increase, making the market more allocatively efficient. Here we go. One step at a time, don't be living on the Price discrimination. Price discrimination is the practice of charging different prices for the same good or service. There are three main types of price discrimination. First degree price discrimination exists when a firm charges a different price for every unit purchased. By charging the maximum possible price for each unit, it can capture all the consumer surplus available. This is also known as perfect price discrimination. While first degree discrimination is relatively rare, second and third degree discrimination are commonly practiced. Second degree discrimination means charging different prices for different quantities purchased, such as discounts for buying in bulk. Third degree discrimination involves charging a different price to different types of consumer. For example, Cinema goers can be subdivided into smaller submarkets, such as adults and children, or students and pensioners. Third degree price discrimination requires certain conditions to be met. Firstly, the firm must be able to identify different submarkets. These submarkets must be kept apart, which can be done in several ways. Firstly, by time, such as peak and off peak pricing. Time based pricing, often called dynamic pricing, is increasingly common with goods and services sold online. Here, prices can change by the minute as consumers reveal their preferences through their online activity, with prices responding quickly to changing demand. Another common way to separate a market is by physical distance, such as selling an identical product in one city at a higher price than in another. Market separation can also be based simply on the type of consumer, such as students or parents, or by exploiting consumer ignorance through complex pricing structures, making it hard for consumers to compare prices and switch to cheaper options. To make price discrimination work effectively, firms need to prevent arbitrage, which is a process where traders, acting as either buyers or sellers, can exploit price differences for identical products, buying where the price is lower, and selling where it is higher. The effect of this is to make prices converge and make sustained price discrimination impossible. In this example, traders buy in the low-priced market and sell in the high-priced market. 
the effect is for prices to converge. Trading can be prevented or limited in several ways, such as having non-transferable travel tickets, limiting the quantities that can be bought, which prevents trading, having licensed traders or outlets, and using new technology to identify and control trading activities. For price discrimination to work, different submarkets must have different price elasticities. Finally, the firm must have some degree of monopoly power. That is, they must be price makers. In evaluating price discrimination, from a firm's perspective it enables profit to be maximized. Diagrammatically, we can see that in the less elastic submarket, the demand curve is steeper and profit is maximized at a higher price. When demand is more elastic, price will be lower. When submarkets are combined, price will be between the two prices. Profits from separation can also be compared with those from combining the submarkets. If we assume marginal cost is constant across all submarkets, whether or not the market is divided, it will equal average total cost. Profits will be maximized at the price and output where marginal cost is identical to marginal revenue. In this case, profits from separating the market at 25 million pounds are greater than from combining the market at 22 million. Price discrimination can benefit firms with high fixed costs associated with the building and maintenance of infrastructure, including natural monopolies like gas and electricity supply, and transport services. Increased revenue may add to profits or be invested back into the infrastructure. Price discrimination may also enable firms to clear their existing stocks quickly when required, hence making better use of their factory or shop space. Time-based discrimination means that the flow of customers can be managed more effectively and perhaps provide a better experience for shoppers. For example, having early bird prices may encourage shoppers to adjust their shopping times so that queues are shortened at peak times. This also ensures that staff are better employed throughout the day. From the consumer's point of view, some, especially those in the highly elastic sub-market, may gain from price discrimination, especially those paying lower prices. If we look at group purchases, low prices from children make it possible for whole families to benefit. For example, if cinemas or theme parks set low prices for children, or even zero price for those under a certain age, more parents will be able to attend, therefore increasing total utility for the family as a whole. The same logic can be applied to travel and holidays, with child and family discounts encouraging demand, generating utility, and helping increase revenue. We can extend the analysis to consider the role of price discrimination in reducing specific market failures, such as enabling the wider consumption of merit goods. For example, if private schools charge high fees for those who are willing to pay, the revenue generated may allow them to offer subsidized places to those who cannot afford them, hence increasing consumption of merit goods. However, it can be argued that consumers in captive submarkets are being unduly exploited as a result of their inelastic demand. If we look at transport, it is clear that very high ticket prices can be charged for peak travel, and with energy prices, existing customers often pay much higher prices, subsidizing the discounts available to new customers. The growth of new trading technologies, apps, online auction bidding, and price comparison websites mean that consumers have increasing information, which may reduce the possibility of price discrimination. However, the widespread use of dynamic pricing models by online sellers means that time-based pricing is increasingly possible. Price discrimination is, clearly, a hugely effective strategy for firms looking to maximize their profits or achieve other business objectives. However, the ability to set prices is an indication monopoly power exists in the market, and this may be to the significant disadvantage of certain consumer groups. To see more videos, go to www.economicsonline.co.uk.